Thank you for joining us today. My name is David Osta, and I'll be the moderator today for the panel discussion, which we've titled Uncertainty to Success, Strategies to Thrive for K-12 Educators. Uh, I myself am an education consultant and strategist, and I work at the Bar Center as a trainer. I began my own career in education as a fifth grade teacher in Washington, D.C., and then I also taught middle school in Chicago, Illinois. Um, excited, uh, my work in education has spanned a bunch of different roles. Since then, uh, focused on teacher development and school improvement uh, in a variety of government and nonprofit roles. So we're excited to have this, uh, this opportunity to have this panel today because here we are in 2021 and educators, students, families continue to face many changes and many challenges. And we're very at Bar Center impressed with uh, those people who've truly taken these uncertain times and turned them into really successful opportunities to serve students. And so that's why we've named our panel this way. So as we worked uh, today, you'll hear a little bit about the Bar Center. For those who are not familiar with it, it's a strengths-based educational model that provides schools with a comprehensive approach to meeting the academic, social, and emotional needs of all students through the power of data and relationships. So today, in just a moment, you'll meet five educational leaders from across the country who are making a difference for students and adults. The leaders are gonna be sharing some strategies they have used to improve staff morale, to design student interventions that consider the whole child, identify and address student mental health needs, and successfully engage students during the pandemic. So it's our goal that today you're gonna to walk away with some concrete strategies that you can use to help your students and your colleagues to really uh, take action and to continue to, to work towards thriving in a very, very difficult environment. This event is going to be recorded and it'll be made available uh, on YouTube. So we'll be following up with that and sharing a link to that early next week um, as well. So what I wanna do now actually is do introductions so you can get to know a little bit about your panelists. They're gonna be the ones talking for the most part today. And so I wanna make sure you know who will be joining us today on the panel and on the screen today. So first, I wanna just tell you a little bit about uh, Frank Camacho Jr. He is in his third year as principal at Eisenhower School in Rialto, California, which is in Southern California. Eisenhower is in its second year of implementing the bar model. He actually is the prou a proud graduate of Eisenhower High School. He has uh, over 25 years of classroom teaching, coaching, and administrative experience. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree at California State University, San Bernardino, and his master's degree in educational leadership from California State University, San Bernardino. So we wanna welcome him and you'll be hearing from him shortly. We also are fortunate enough to have, have Ed Matthews uh, Ed is principal at uh, South Fort Myers High School, which is on the Gulf side of South Florida. South, uh, South Fort Myers High School is in their second year of implementing the bar model. Uh, principal Matthews was named the 2017 Person of the Year by News Press, the 2019 High Impact Principal by the Florida DOE, and the 2020 Principal of the Year for the School District of Lee County by the Teachers Association of Lee County. So very glad to have um, him with us today and you'll hear from him shortly. Also uh, joining us today is Dr. Dion Olamiju, who is an assistant principal at Spring Valley High School in Rockland County, New York, which is just north of New York City. She's currently the administrator for the Future Leaders Ninth Grade Academy, where the bar program is implemented and where significant improvements have been noted in student academic progress. Dr. Olamiju received her bachelor's degree from Liam College, her master's degree from the College of New Rochelle, and her doctorate degree from St. John Fisher College, where she focused on factors that foster resilience in students. So we're glad to have Dr. Olamiju with us as well. I also want you to know a little bit about Dr. Mark Sander, who is a senior clinical psychologist at Hennepin County and the director of school mental health for Hennepin County and the Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, Dr. Sanders is a visiting scholar at the Wilder Research and is a member of the advisory board for the Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Previously, he was an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, 
Dr. Sander is also on the board of directors for the Minnesota Trauma Project. Dr. Sander earned his doctorate from the Minnesota School of Professional Psychology. And finally, I want to make sure you know we have Dr. Emily Shaw with us, who is in our 11th year as principal at Hemet High School and Hemet Unified School District, which is located in Southern California. Her school was actually one of the first schools to implement the bar model and helped to test and improve it. Dr. Shaw has been named the Western Riverside County Association uh, of School Administrators Co-Administrator of the Year, Riverside County Woman of the Year, and has been recognized by Barr for her work as an early adopter of the Barr model. She earned her doctorate from the University of Laverne. So that's quick introductions. I hope I got those right. They'll clarify anything I might need to clarify. I just wanted to make sure you know a little bit about who will have joining us today uh, as we get into our conversation. At the end of today's discussion, the way we'll just structure that we'll have time to take questions. You're able to enter those questions um, as we go, and we'll be keeping track of those questions. So um, by all means, please uh, you know, enter those questions into the chat. And if you um, do that, we'll do our best to get to them either right away or at the end, and, and again, try to make the most of our time together. Um, before. And you can see on your screen right now, there's a few technical notes, of course, that you, you might want to note that'll help to make sure you have, uh, you know, the best possible technical experience here as we uh, use uh, our system here for our conversation. So by, by all means, um, take a look at that. Make sure your um, audio using your speakers is really um, great. And this system is actually built to use your computer speakers, so please do that. And you can expand uh, things on the console so you can adjust the view that's best for you. So by all means, um, do that as, as it makes sense for you to have a very good technical experience. So um, now let's get started and hear from our uh, panelists. So we're hoping to ask each of the principals here if they could just take a moment to let us know how their school has looked for the past year during the pandemic. Um, our panelists are from across the country, so we thought it'd be important for you to understand kind of what their learning environment has been since COVID. Um, we know that in many cases, some have been in-person, hybrid, uh, distance learning, and or a combination of all of it. So if we could uh, just start our conversation by hearing from our panelists, um, why don't we go ahead and start um, with uh, Mr. Camacho, if that would be possible for you to, to share that with us. Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is uh, Frank Camacho, Principal of Eisenhower High School. Um, thank you again uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, just a real quick, um, we we have been in distance learning the, the whole entire time. Uh, we have had some obstacles as well. Um, in in September, we had a malware attack where it, uh, instruction and education was lost for about a month. Uh, we had a you know, re clean the, the the system out, and and we had to just change, uh, you know, focus on how to get instruction out to students, and by that it, it really dropped the morale of our students and really dropped the, the morale of our of our of our staff because we were just in the flow of getting used to distance learning, and when this interruption happened, um, we had to play catch up, and for this whole quarter. Uh, for the whole semester, we were actually playing catch up. Um, we weren't really focused on instruction uh, because we were behind the eight ball in a sense. And now we are just now getting back into, uh, you know, getting back to our instructional foci. And to build that staff and that morale, uh, we we couldn't we couldn't we also did, couldn't have students come on campus or do drive bys, um, you know, activities as well because we were in the purple. And Rialto has always been um, high in the purple, where um, we couldn't we couldn't participate in any type of activities in San Bernardino County, and so we would have to stay focused in, in making sure that uh, we were communicating as well as possible with our staff, our community. We were having con constant um, parent forums um, through through the internet uh, virtually. Uh, weekly, um, some uh, and some and some committees a month, uh, biweekly. Uh, staff, we had to have a meeting with staff uh, every three 
uh, three or four days just to let them know where we're at with, uh, you know, the progress of the malware attack. We also had to adjust and making sure um, we were giving assignments, project assignments out to students so they can they can uh, stay focused and stay on task with their assignments as well. Um, Thanks and so much so for that. Um, in doing so, we, we would... Yeah, so thanks so much. I'm going to uh, just have a couple other principals give us a quick preview, and, and then I think we want to pick up and hear more. Um, but thanks for giving us that background on where, where you kind of have been. Um, if we could just hear from Principal Matthews um, just to hear a little bit about where have you been in terms of um, in-person, hybrid, remote, and kind of how your year has flowed. We'll get into some deeper um, questions soon. So uh, South Fort Myers High School is uh, located in South Florida. And since at the, for the conclusion of last school year, we uh, finished up virtual and uh, we had to be creative at the end of the year for our senior activities in regards to curbside graduation, uh, different things to bring closure. And then as we go into this school year, we, uh, we started out the year at about half capacity of face-to-face -face learning followed by hybrid where students would log on um, at home to the classroom while the teacher was teaching in person. And then with the lead virtual system. And so the morale has been up and down. Uh, currently we're dealing you know, with uh, people uh, being taken out of the building by the Department of Health for uh, COVID reasons, but we're still moving strong and uh, the kids are enjoying athletics, after school activities, and um, we just recently had a group of students come back to us uh, and you could just see how excited they were to be back in the building. So we're, good things are happening and we're excited to have the kids back in the building. Thanks for that quick overview, appreciate that. And we actually uh, can see kids are walking around campus right now in the background. So it looks like school is in session, huh? That's great to see. Um, Dr. Olamiju, would you be able to just share a little bit about your story of kind of what you've been uh, experiencing over the last year or so in terms of in-person, hybrid, um, and those combinations? Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Yeah, so I work in a school that's 100% uh, free lunch, where most of our students do receive free lunch. So the challenge for us was getting devices to our students. So when we started the year, the biggest uh, goal was to make sure we could distribute uh, Chromebooks to our students. So that's what we did before we could even begin the learning. Another thing that we had to do was to ensure that our students had food in their houses. So we were getting messages that students did not have enough to eat. Uh, parents were dying. We lost a lot of parents in our community. Rockland County was hit very hard with the virus. So we had to do a lot of emotional social support before we could even begin the academics. So I would say around November, the end of November, that we had about 80%, 85% of our students had received their devices. So now we are in a hybrid approach, but most of the kids remain remote because of the, the COVID rate, the high COVID rate. Most of them continue to remain at home and to do remote learning. But um, it has caused us to just connect with them even more. Morale is better now, I should say, because of the connections we've been doing with them. They've got their devices. They have their hotspots. So I think the work we did before, um, actually focusing on the academics, is what I think has really helped us and is pushing us forward. Thank you for giving mm -hmm. us a little picture into uh, what school has been like and what life has been like. Uh, for you. Um, now let's hear from Dr. Shaw for just a moment in Hemet. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. So as Dr. Camacho mentioned, California has a, a tiered system. We thought purple was the be all end all, but we've actually moved into deep purple. And we, um, Riverside County has the highest positivity rate in the state at 130 cases per 100,000. So since March 16th of 2019 or 2020, we have not had students on campus um, in any capacity with the exception of about 40 um, severely handicapped students that came on campus in small cohorts. 
and that lasted about two weeks before we had so many staff positives that we ran into a staffing issue and were unable to adequately staff classes. So small cohorts were shut down um, after just about 13 days of running. We are currently still in a full distance learning model. We did issue 100% um, of our students Chromebooks, that's pre-K through 12, um, as well as hotspots. Hemet Unified is the seventh largest geographic district in the state of California, covering more than 700 square miles. So we have a lot of rural areas and our district um, located buses in those communities so, um, as Wi-Fi, I guess, signal boosters so that the students even in rural areas, if their hotspots weren't working, continue to have internet access so that we could remain in a distance learning model. So thanks, thanks to all four of our principals for sharing a little bit of a window into um, what you've been doing, what the challenges you've been facing, and some of the responses you've had. And that's what the rest of our conversation is going to be about. Um, so you'll get a chance to expand on some of the things uh, you've already said, and, and our audience will get to hear some more detail, because I'm sure they're curious to hear more about what you've done. So we've broken up our conversation to a few topics. Um, and Dr. Shaw, we're actually going to come back to you um, right away here. We wanted to pick up on this idea of staff morale. Um, that's been mentioned a couple of times already, uh, it being so important uh, about the well-being of our staff, our educators who are in uh, these roles of supporting student learning and of supporting the, the success of students and their families in many cases. Um, so if you could give us a little bit more, maybe elaborate, Dr. Shaw, how have you taken care of your staff so that they are able to do that work of supporting students? I'm sure many of our attendees have read the book, um, Make Sure You Feed the, the Teacher So They Don't Eat the, the Students. Um, we acknowledge that SEL was very important. Fortunately, BAR had already begun that, um, kind of leading the way through SEL practices. But many of us know BAR is only a ninth grade program. So we, it very intentionally this school year, contracted with a company called Thriving University and we've taken our staff through an eight session um, training all about SEL strategies. And the presenters adapted on the fly and were able to do SEL strategies in a virtual wo world, as well as providing multiple, multiple resources to teachers so that they, it's almost like make and takes. Um, so the teachers could get the training and then immediately after that, um, go into the classroom and implement SEL strategies that they saw throughout the training. And so as we did classroom walkthroughs, we were able to observe those practices in place. And many teachers adopted um, Wednesday as our late start day or modified day. So many of our teachers adopted SEL Wednesdays to support students. Now, we also engaged staff in SEL strategy. So we begin every staff meeting with an SEL strategy. Um, that's adult appropriate, but could very easily be trans, um, transferred into the classroom with students. And then daily, I send an SEL message to staff, um, generally around a theme. So the month of October, we really focused on self-care um, and the importance of being able to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And the month of December was focusing on how to connect with students in a very intentional way so that you had internal satisfaction and job satisfaction. And then currently, um, right now, it is um, self, the, the theme for the month is positive and self affirmations. And so I'm very intentional with what I send out to staff as far as strategies, not only to take care of um, our students, but to remind them to take care of themselves. Thanks so much for telling us a little bit about the practices and strategies you've been using. It sounds like one of the keys there is that it's very intentional. Um, so that's not something that is um, simply uh, in words, but it's you've developed strategies and actions that you can keep building upon. So thanks for sharing that. I actually want to ask Dr. Sander, um, in, your, in your experience and in the roles you've played, um, hoping to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about other self-care strategies that educational leaders can use during these difficult times. Um, I think that 
um, we need a variety of strategies, and I wonder which ones um, you might recommend or which ones you've seen um, being used with some success. Yeah, thanks so much. So, so here in 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 Minnesota, in in Hennepin County, um, you know, a lot of our schools have been doing distance learning. Some have been um, in in hybrid. So, I, I think you know one of the really important things for staff is that feeling of connection. Like, how do we connect not only with students but with each other, uh, especially maybe if we're not in the building? So, I think it's so important to, you know. Um, as, as a school have those rituals and routines, not only for the students, but also for the adults. Um, to really be, you know, as school leaders, be modeling self-care um, and talking about it. And what are you doing? Um, uh, I think some other things that I've seen um, uh, is that people are, are doing like, um, just having like stand in, times for like checking in so let's have a, a google uh, excuse me a google meets uh link open over the lunch hour or at you know at the end of the day for people to kind of come together like they might if they were doing in-person learning uh, i think getting out and and exercising and and just getting outside and moving your body movement is so important um and then i think you know lastly um having fun and and planning uh time every day to just to have some fun and again we really need our school leaders to be modeling that and so um you know just different ways to kind of model and and show and and kind of lead from that kind of fun open uh kind of space david can i add something to that real quick please do all right so um that was great information that was provided by Dr. Sander. One of the things that, that we found our staff struggles the most with right now is maintaining that healthy work-life balance. Because when you're working at a school site or in a, in a place of employment, at the end of the day, you can shut the door and walk out. But when you're working from home, um, it's especially if you're using your coffee table or, or a common space to do that work, it's very hard to separate. And we're finding teachers are spending more hours working from home than they would in the classroom. And so it's giving teachers permission to unplug and separate and really say at the end, this is the end of my day and I am not going to check emails or respond to students or grade papers after a certain point, because now more than ever, I think that balance is critical. Okay. Hi, Thanks. this is uh, Dr. Alamiju. Can I just add something as well? Please yes, do. I would say, uh, one, yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, has worked for us is me as the leader of the ninth grade academy being genuine, you know, me expressing my fears, my concerns, just as the teachers would to me and to each other. And I think it's important to validate what they're feeling. I mean, we are in the pandemic, everyone is afraid. So we start off connecting on that level. But then also being intentional about us taking care of ourselves. One of the things that I do whenever we have our meetings on the agenda, it's always wellness. That's the first item. You know, we go around and everyone has to say how they're feeling, you know, what concerns they're having, what fears, and, and that really does help. Uh, we did a social emotional activity with our teachers where you know, they had to share and some teachers, they cried as they expressed their fears, their concerns, but just releasing those emotions has forged a stronger connection that, than we've ever had. So I would say just being your yourself, you know, just because I'm, I'm a leader in the building does not mean I have to be strong at all times. I have to know it all. I think relying on the teachers, us looking at each other as part of a team. I don't have all the answers. They may have some answers that I need. I may have some answers that they need, but recognizing we are not alone as we deal with the challenges of this pandemic has really helped us uh, just become strong, stronger connected. Thanks so much. Thank so I really appreciate hearing all those. We, we need to consider modeling this 
being an example, mm -hmm. allowing others to model and be an example of this, mm -hmm. inviting the language and validating what's going on. Um, the, the idea of just being tough is not going to work in this case, we know. And then all that intentionality we've heard from everybody, appreciate everybody saying that it, it, can't, um, it can't be underscored enough that, that we have to really set aside the time and the spaces and many of them to be able to do that kind of self-care work. Um, what I want to do now is to move us into a, 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 a next topic. And that is, uh, we titled this topic, Thinking About Designing Student Interventions That Consider the Whole Child. So want to get a couple of our other principals involved uh, in this part of the conversation. But just as a quick intro, um, many students have experienced a lot of learning loss during the pandemic. And they've also experienced a lot of personal and social loss. Um, that's more than ever, um, more than we've ever seen in, in our careers. So I want to um, talk to Principal Matthews and, and just get you involved. Uh, so the, the question I have in mind here is, what do you have in place to bridge the gaps in learning that have occurred as a result of the way we've had to you know, operate our schools, both this spring and, and then, I mean, last spring and then into you know, this fall and winter, um, you know, in a time when you really didn't have a lot of time to prepare uh, like you normally would for a normal year. So what have you put in place and how have you responded to that challenge? Well, I'd like to uh, just build on what Dr. Sanders stated, as well as the other uh, individuals on the on the call. And you know, number one, we're we're staying true to who we are, and that is a uh, high touch, uh, connected school to our students, teachers, and staff, and and connecting with our uh, population is provided to where not only you know we we have a structure where we have assigned teams and, and assigned duties and assigned um, outcomes that we're looking for. When we were in face-to-face -face learning before March, we, did, we just continued that on as we move forward through the uh, distance learning model. And then as we went into the summertime for professional development with our teachers, uh, we continued that as we went back to face-to-face -face learning and uh, go through the hybrid model as well as the transitioning through the Lee, uh, Lee Virtual School System. And the, everything that everybody said is right on board with what we're doing here at uh, South Fort Myers High School, and I believe that everybody else is trying to do across the nation. And when you look at the kids and the outcomes of knowing it cares about them, and, and I would say, you know, a lot of times they say you, you want to have one person in a school that connects with them. But then when you're looking at multiple people reaching out to the same student, we're seeing amazing outcomes for, for that to happen. So, you know, number one, I would say just keep it simple. You know, do what you do best, you know, in connecting with kids and uh, making sure that you have that foundation of the teams as well as the practices that you have put in place in uh, interventions where you're, you're identifying kids that are high risk, medium risk, and, and low risk, and accommodating all of those students for, the, for their needs. And I would just say that, uh, you know, what we've seen at South Fort Myers High School has been incredible. Based off of that, when we started out the year, we only had about a half the population that wanted to come into face-to-face -face learning uh, because of the fear of COVID. And as more and more kids talked, and, and more importantly, their families talked, you know, we're now up to, 83% uh, of our population back in the school building. And I would expect that when the semester completes, you know, our goal is to get 90% of our population back into the building. So it's an exciting time. I know that it's a struggle. And, um, you know, the big thing that uh, I would say to all our educators that, that I take on is, you know, you set the tone as the educational leader. And um, what everybody said here is so true. You know, you got to be fun. You got to, you got to connect. And you and you got to you got to put those expectations out there that every kid is going to be successful and uh, and bars allowed us to do that. Thanks so much for for that. Appreciate that. Um, big key here is being intentional about our relationships, um, whether that's something that's a habit of already in your building, or whether that's something um, that is you know a new intentionality. It sounds like that's one key you touched upon there. That's very important. Dr. Olamiju, I wanted to turn to you to build off a question we got in, in our chat, as well as a question I think we had in mind for you to think about already, which is how do you make sure that interventions you put in place, um, both academic, you know, meet the academic and social needs of students? Um, in particular, 
you know, some students struggle with completing their work in a virtual environment. So maybe you can talk about how to how you've addressed that one in particular as you as you give your comments. But in first, just tell us about this idea of make the interventions. How do you make sure that they are going to meet both academic and social needs that, that students are experiencing, that they're presenting, or that um, you as educators are observing? Absolutely. Well, I must say, uh, connections with our students is key. You know, before we can provide any type of academic interventions, I believe it's important we understand the stories of our children. I believe every child has a story, and it's incumbent upon us as educators to find out what those stories are. So, for example, the end of a, a week, end of a month, we may look at the data and see that the child is not succeeding. Well, then we need to know exactly what's going on. So that makes us have a conversation with the student. We need to find out from the parents what's going on. Um, and we do that in our team meetings. We have lots of conversations in our team meetings about observations that teachers have seen. And then we meet with the children and their parents. And interventions are tailored. You know, it's not one size fits all approach. So for example, if a child is not the way they work, we need to find out maybe is it that they have a lot of responsibilities at home that they may not be able to complete their work. And if that's the case, then we would have the child stay with us after school and a teacher would be there to help get them caught up. Um, maybe there is some level of you know, physical abuse at home. So, so those are the things that we have to find out. But I must tell you, it, in my school, the teachers know failure is not an option for our students. The students know that as well. And we do whatever we can to differentiate the interventions to tailor to meet the needs of our students so that all of our students will succeed. And um, the way we make sure that it is working is by constantly following up, constantly uh, looking at the data, having conversations to ensure that what we're doing is working. If it's not working, then we have to take it to the next level, which we call risk review. And that includes uh, me, the administrator, the guidance counselors, the psychologists. We work with community organizations as well, social services. We even work with our local police department, you know, to find out how we could collaborate to meet the needs of our students. But, you know, like I said, you know, for us, it is important that our children experience success in ninth grade. Ninth grade is a critical year. So we have to do whatever we can to ensure that our students uh, achieve success. And tailoring the interventions to meet their needs is paramount. A child might miss 10 assignments. Of course, it's overwhelming for them to make up 10 assignments in three different classes. So the teachers come up with a plan where Johnny might work on, on five assignments in English, and after that is completed, then we'll make up some of the assignments in math. But we just find different ways to ensure. But I think what really propels us to do that is it's strength-based. Base. Before we even begin to look at what the problem is, we look at what the strengths of the students are. You know, and it could be, you know, Johnny is friendly or he smiles every day, he's polite, uh, he might get along with one teacher uh, out of the team, but we look for some strength. Johnny likes to play football, and we will use that in order to get through to the kid, in order to provide the intervention. But uh, you cannot separate academic intervention from emotional or social interventions. They're intertwined. But I believe it's important that you're able to support them emotionally and socially first so that they learn to trust you, they know you care. And I believe when students know you care, they will work hard for you. I've seen it. So I think it's important to form those strong bonds, those strong connections initially, and then everything else usually falls in place. Thanks, Thanks so much for all of that and, and those examples. Um, really sounds like it starts with meeting and having good data when you meet to know where students are and then in those meetings having the relationships and the tailoring of ideas to what's going to support that student as as a whole student um, and that involves some amount of creativity and planning but you have ways to do that which is 
which is great. So thank you so much for all of that. And I wanna actually just add one more voice to this part of our conversation. Um, Principal Camacho, uh, I think, you know, Dr. Olamiju mentioned this a little bit, you know, sometimes you have to adjust students' plans. So we can't have a plan that only has sort of one path or one route. Um, so how should educators think about adjusting plans to help them continue to achieve uh, even during these very unprecedented times? What kind of adjustments should we be making? What kind of adjustments are you making in, in your building? So yeah, so um, we're, we're right on with um, the last panelist, what she, what she talked about and, and having conversations in our PLCs and our teams and departments on checking for uh, the data and, and seeing how we can support the child's needs in, in, as a whole child. Um, we're still distance learning. Um, we'll, we'll probably still continue to be in distance learning through spring break and possibly into um, the full year. So our, our children are not getting the services that the majority of the country is getting, uh, especially with athletics and, and things like that. So what I've done is um, I, I went into two areas. I, I created a SEL team um, and that SEL team, um, there's about 20 staff members um, classified and certificated and they broke off into sections. I have trained them in uh, the assist uh, model in which um, they, they are able to know on how to identify suicide prevention. Um, they don't know just enough so where they can, when they have a, a student that wants to um, have a conversation about suicide, they have enough to hold them and then um, reach out for support so they can get a, a, a team out there to, for, uh, for support, uh, to support them in, in, in suicide prevention. Um, we also have a, a hot, hot, a, a hotline um, going to the team as well, so so we can make contact with them. Uh, so for intervention, and then secondly, um, a lot of our students, but well, we have we have 2,100 students that are Latinos, and then we have 250 that are African American, and and 100 students that are other. So the diversity uh, the diversity is 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 shown in our in our district versus the more affluent districts and more so in, in, in what's happening in society with, with, with the social justice issues. And so we develop a equity, um, an equity uh, team, a social justice team um, to, for students to be able to um, uh, voice their opinion um, uh, with staff and, and be able to have those conversations with staff. And so in the following year, we're gonna have an ethnic studies pathways where students are able to take classes in uh, Afro-Latin jazz, um, also, women's studies, uh, multicultural lit, uh, and race and gender classes as well. Uh, thanks so much for bringing us into that part of the conversation. We have had a, a pandemic going on related to COVID, but we've had an, an equally um, trying time across our country as it relates to issues of equity and social and racial justice. And thanks for lifting that up because that, um, for many of our students, is more impactful than anything. Um, that we can think of uh, related to some of the, the management of our public health needs. Um, that's certainly a public health need as well. And thanks for your comments brought us into thinking about mental health because that's our, our well-being is, is really, we know, the key um, you know, to having a, a successful social and academic uh, you know, path for students. So I wanted to ask Dr. Sander to describe some of the mental health needs that you're seeing in students. Um, and, and maybe comment a little bit on that, and then we'll get into talk, talking about FERDs as we see them. You bet. Thank you. I, you know, I think you know, and, and some of our uh, panelists have already kind of touched on it, but I think you know, one thing that I think we're seeing more of now is much more of what we call the internalizing concerns, so depression, anxiety. Uh, I think you know, there's loss and we've talked about that I think a lot already today um, but we've got this what we talk about in in the mental health field as ambiguous loss right so it's just loss and there's you know nothing to blame it on or point to it's just kind of there and kind of sits and it can be it can be tough I think we've got loneliness um, and you know lack of of being able to connect in ways. So I think there's a lot that's going on. And I think the other thing is when we think about, you know, multi-tiered systems of support or, 
you know, positive behavior interventions and supports, I think there's a lot more students that are needing support at tier two. Right? They might not have a clinical diagnosis, but there's just a lot of sadness and maybe you know, ups and downs that just kind of come with the day or feeling blah. And I think um, there's a lot of strategies that we've got to talk about, about how do we engage students? Um, and a lot of it comes through the relationship. Uh, relationships are just so important right now and, and they can be tough to do virtually. So I think that's, you know, um, really what we've got to be mindful of as, as we're moving, uh, you know, through the pandemic in, in whatever way that you are in or doing school uh, is like, how do we have those uh, relationships and connections? Because that's really what, what students are really needing right now. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that. And I was wondering, uh, D Dr. Olamiju, if you'd jump in and, and maybe add some more about how to best address these needs that um, we've been describing, uh, you as a panel have been describing, and, and Dr. Sander just sort of gave us some language for. Uh, what, what are some of the ways that we can continue to address those needs? Well, at our school, we have our iTimes. Weekly iTime is the opportunity for teachers to not look at their content area subject, but to teach those social emotional uh, skills uh, once a week. So it rotates between the different departments. And, and that's been really good. We address issues or topics such as finding commonalities how to engage in positive self-talk, how to express gratitude. And I usually participate with my students and, and that's like the best part of my week. So um, every week, like I said, it rotates and I would join in with them. And um, it gives us an opportunity to express how we're feeling. The last one that I was in, it was about expressing gratitude to someone who's made a big, big impact in your lives. I, and you have to write a letter to them and share it. I wrote a letter to my grandmother uh, who's no longer with me and um, I had to read it out loud. The whole class and myself were in tears. But I must tell you what was amazing, in the chat box, the kids were writing, rest in peace, grandma. Um, we care about you, Dr. O. You know, we're with you and, you know, and that allowed them. But that really created a big connection for me with them and with their teachers as well. So for us, the ITEM activities, that once a week opportunity to not teach algebra, to not teach global history, but instead use, utilize that time to connect, that has been very powerful. And um, the teachers have expressed themselves, who they are, who their families are, what their feelings are, their fears, their concerns, and the students have done that as well. And that has brought us together. And for me, even though we are hybrid, like I said, most of our students are a remote at their homes. I have been able to sit in my office and go into so many classrooms all at once without ever leaving my office. And it's the best opportunity for me to connect with students. I've, I've gone into more classrooms than ever. They know who I am. I remind them I am there to work for them their teachers work for them. We are there to ensure that they are successful. You know, I say that over and over again. I used to say that when they were in the building and they knew that if anyone, you know, spoke to them in a manner they didn't like, they knew they had advocates and they would march into my office and say, you know, this is what happened. This teacher said this to me, et cetera. But I think just letting them know we are here for them, but also we are experiencing the same thing and just sharing who we are. Um, that has fostered strong connections with our ninth graders and with our teachers and myself. Thanks so much for sharing that. I wanted to get uh, Principal Camacho to join as well. Um, I guess the question we have thought here is also to add here is, what do you think people need to know about the experience that your staff and families and students um, are you know, going through that, that will help get an insight into what you've learned about how your staff, your students, and families are experiencing this time period. What can you tell us about their stories that you think is, is um, important to well, hear or to hear again for some people? Yeah, I, I think stories are, are, are huge right now. I think students, uh, I mean, they're not necessarily broken, as some would say, or need to be fit. I think they just need to be heard. 
um, as mentioned by some of the panelists, and, and then we can identify how we can support them as well. Uh, what, we've, uh, what we've done, we, uh, we uh, 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 are using Panorama. Panorama is a social emotional system out here in, in California. I'm not sure if it's nationwide that people are using it. And we've been um, using that to uh, monitor the students' uh, progress and what, what they, uh, how to identify the, uh, and, and address the students' mental health needs. Uh, simple questions, uh, how are you doing? How are, how are the teachers treating you? Do you like school? Um, have you ever thought about suicide? Simple questions like that. And then we get the data and we, we begin to monitor how, where, where we need to uh, support the students. Um, and so, um, and so that's one of the things we're doing as well. Thanks. Would anybody else like to add something about sort of just making sure we hear, you know, what school has, has been like, what this time period has been like, um, that we just kind of need to, to honor the, that what's going on with our families and students. I think the last thing we're going to talk about in a moment is about engagement, but first we have to kind of know where we've had those challenges of, of what's going on with our families. So, David, I know you said we're moving into re-engagement next, but um, in California, there's a Senate Bill 98, which is what governs the implementation of distance learning. And a component of that, it specifies the number of minutes students must be in seat for it to count as an instructional day, that it can be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning, that meals must be provided every day um, for families. But one of the pieces in that says that students who do not attend class for three or more days must be contacted by a re-engagement committee or a re-engagement team. And so um, we were able to establish a re-engagement team and right away started getting on students who were demonstrating non-attendance, whether it be chronic non-attendance or whether it be just a random, I'm going to be out for three days, let's contact them and follow up. When we've been unsuccessful in contacting them via phone, my administrative team and I, we have done over 500 home visits this school year to get in um, and contact, connect with kids. In a lot of cases, we found they just didn't know how to access um, the program or the system. In particular, our newcomers, um, students who don't speak the English language as a, as a primary language, and their families were really struggling. And so one of the ways to find out the story about what's going on in the home is by going to the home. Great, thanks for sharing that. And if I could ask you maybe to keep going for a moment. Um, so what is kind of the next big challenge or the, or the, or the uh, current challenge you're really facing right now that you're starting to take on, you're starting to um, really get organized with? I, I know that every time we, um, make some progress. We always have something new that's that's um, kind of asking our energy and asking our our creativity. What is what is on your kind of um, you know screen right now that that's going to be the next challenge for you? Truly, um, the biggest item on our on our radar, or that's um, I guess the iron in the fire, as they say, is grading practices. And so we knew we had an issue um, regarding grades, beef, and it's a systemic issue across our district. A student shouldn't get smarter because they moved into a classroom next door where the teacher has a different grading policy and they went from a C in one class to an A in another. Um, California has really rigorous um, employee or really tough employee unions. And so currently the power of the grade resides with the teacher under education code as well as um, board policy and in contract. And so we're really working hard to um, establish proper grading practices that are consistent, not just at our school, but across the district. Um, we also know that in California, failure, I, I, I love what Dr. O said, um, failure is not an option. I love to say failure is not an option, but the reality is we have students who are not engaged and who are not doing the work. And so there is no other way to grade them. Um, in a classroom, I could walk down the rows, and if a student's not engaged, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I need you to do this paper. But if they're signing into class, turning their camera off and checking out, I can't go and tap them on the shoulder. No matter how many times you call them back on the camera, it just doesn't work. Um, 
So we know systemically across the, the state and in, in many parts of the country, there was higher than average failures. Uh, on a normal school year, we may range about 12% Fs across the school, um, grades nine through 12. Um, last year, when we ended the year, we were at about 18%. And um, when we hit the first grading mark, we were at 50% failures in grades nine through 12. And we ended the semester at 18%. Um, so we started tackling grading practices hard and heavy. Um, we have a short-term plan. Short-term was just to get through the semester, um, not with a, any, without um, any radical board policy. So at the end of last year, we our, the state says, students can get a pass or fail grade and colleges will accept those. So um, our district took the stand A, B, C, or P. So any student was getting a D or an F got a P, which was awarded credit. That is not an option this year or an, and not an option moving forward. Um, so short term was to get through the semester with conversations, individual conversations with students um, focus groups, we did a focus group with kids who are really successful and we're working on a focus group of kids not engaged. But um, long term, we'll be working with Doug Reeves to really reform grading practices, Not again, not just at our school, but across the district because we do have four comprehensive high schools and a lot of transiency within our district. Thanks for talking us through that and sharing some of your data, some of your challenges. That's uh, so important. and. Um, wanted to ask Principal Matthews to weigh in too here, talking about engagement. What have you been doing to engage students in these various learning environments, virtual and um, of course in person? How have you been thinking about and how, you, how have you been supporting uh, engagement, making students feel connected to school and connected to their work? Mr. Matthews, do we have you there? We uh, we have no sound right now. You might be muted. Well, as he gets organized, um, would anybody else like to jump in and offer some thoughts about engagement? Um, it's such a challenge, and, and we could spend the whole time talking about that, but let's share a few ideas on engagement now. I think, Dr. O, you're going to jump in? Yeah, I was going to say, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I make a lot of phone calls um, to parents at night. I think one way to connect with students is to connect with their parents. Um, I do that in the evenings because I know they work um, at, during the day. And parents are usually very grateful. And in those calls, I make, you know, I try to find commonalities. You know, I'm a mom. I share I have a daughter, so I want the best for your daughter too, et cetera. Um, but also with my students, we have our virtual town halls. And um, because if we were in the building, we would have been having our assemblies. So having the virtual town halls, you know, with our, my PowerPoint presentation, um, data, you know, we, we do our quarterly state of the academy assembly where I share data with them, academic data, you know, the failure rate, mastery, um, attendance data, you know, with them. So they know this is where we are and these are the areas we need to improve upon. I think it's important that they know the status of the academy and also their own status. Um, you know, I have phone calls with them even though they're virtual and I let them know what their data is looking like, right? You're in the red, that means you failed three or more subjects, right? Or you're in the yellow you know, you failed one subject. So just having those honest conversations with them has helped um, to, to motivate them to work harder because they know if they're in the red now, they want to move to a yellow next quarter, if not to the green where you're passing everything. So that's another way of connecting with them, showing them the data. Thanks so much, Dr. O. Um, and Principal Matthews, I think you wanted to add as well about engagement. Is 
So Principal Matthews, I'm not hearing you coming through, so um, we'll we'll figure out the tech on this for just a moment here. Um, one thing I just maybe as a, 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 a final a close out a little bit of this section, um, maybe if one or two people could offer what they've done in terms of either academic or social strategies to think about how the, um, the work and what we're asking students to do has changed so that they become more engaged. Um, we know in some cases what we used to do um, may not work uh, when we were in person. So we've had to come up with new ways to keep the strategies um, you know, fresh and to keep the engagement uh, you know, very real for the students. So maybe we could have one or more jump in. You know, I, I would just say um, when we were in the classroom, students would work in groups. Virtually, we still create breakout groups for them to work in and share and present. So that has been very positive. Um, but also giving them multiple ways to demonstrate their understanding, helping them to be creative, you know, draw something, write a poem, you know, just tapping into their creativity has been positive. Uh, so those things have really worked for us. And um, giving them, finding multiple opportunities to give them extra credit. Uh, what we do is when we do our parent workshops, you know, parents who show up, we, we write their students' names, th their children's names, and those kids get extra points for that. So just letting them know we want you to succeed. You know, we want to stay connected with you. We want you to stay motivated and just finding multiple pathways for success. I think that's the key. Uh, because we recognize the emotional toll that this pandemic has taken. We have students who suffer from anxiety. So for us to say you need to complete this, um, this, amount, this amount of work definitely would set them back. So uh, just being flexible, being creative. Um, I know New York State Department of Education, they recognize the emotional toll um, they have suspended um, standardized exams for January because they did recognize the toll on our students. And I anticipate the same may happen in June. We have not heard from them as yet, but I don't know how they could do that, um, knowing what our kids have experienced. So I would say just being flexible, be, helping them to be creative and just utilizing technology in a way that gets them to communicate, to collaborate, and to express and to share what their experiences are. Thanks, Dr. O. Um, we're just about to the end of our time together. Want to make sure we open the mics back up for our panelists, maybe a final comment or two, or a final thing they wanted to say. Um, one thing I'll just mention as we go out, if you wanted to address this, um, part of what we need to do we know is to make sure students stay connected to each other socially. And so if anybody's had some luck and had some strategies that they think have had success, making sure that students connect with students, um, that's obviously a big deal in a, a ninth grade year, but it's a big deal in any year in the schooling to make sure that they have peer-to-peer -peer connections. So I'll jump in on that one, David. Um, I know through the iTime activities that our, that our ninth grade classes have been able to do, students have been able to connect um, student to student. One of the other opportunities that are provided is um, our district exclusively uses Google, and teachers have been very creative in figuring out ways to do breakout rooms within Google. Um, and they'll set up the breakout rooms even on asynchronous times for students to come in and help one another um, and have conversations. We've also done some lunch bunches where, you know, we'll have just an open line and you can come on and join us. Um, we've done multiple drive-through opportunities um, for students to drive through with, in Halloween costumes and passed out candy. We've done um, a light up drive-through parade at Christmas time. Um, even under our current state home order, we've been trying to be as creative as possible to get kids included. On the last question that you asked, I just wanted to add real quick. Um, 
We have a lot of classes that are co-technical education and hands-on base. And so our teachers have been very creative in working with um, businesses and, and within our, our site budget and providing kits by unit. So we've had kids, um, the local hardware store donated all the wood and, ha and hammers and kids in our ag mechanics class were able to make birdhouses. Um, yesterday, they were able to go in their yard and get twigs and they were making a fairy garden out of things that they were able to find in their yard for our ag floriculture class. So um, it, it's really just finding ways to promote engagement in a classroom that normally would be hands-on um, where they can't do our theater department did an, a radio broadcast, like an old school radio broadcast, um, theater production. We've done um, multiple band performances where through synthesizing software. So I think if, if we're willing to put in the time, um, we can get kids to be engaged with activities that, it, that, that they normally would have in an unusual circumstance. Thanks so much for that, appreciate that. Um, Wanda, just because we've had some tech uh, concerns to see if uh, Principal Matthews is able to get the mic on right for this moment. Uh, can you hear me now? We sure can. If you'd offer a final comment on something you think has hey, been resonating hey, for you. There but, you go. Yeah, why don't you close this out today? <laughs> we'll, we'll move to conclusion, but we want to make sure your voice gets in here. So thanks so much for your patience. All right. So uh, what I was going to say earlier in, in regards to engagement and in regards to just dealing, you know, with technology, and you know with all the stuff that happens in, in the world that we're living now is uh, you know make it personal make your connection personal whether it's the check-in with the kid as, a, as an individual check-in as a class check-in with the teacher uh, schedule that time honor that time make sure that they are the most important thing at that moment and that their success is is uh, the most important thing I want to make a connection to, I heard the word story and the, the thinking. I know a lot of times we talk about positive mindset, but I think in order to have a, a context to, to what's happening now is really framing things through the, the art of the story and the fact that uh, each kid, each staff member, the school, the community, everyone has a story and, and we are responsible for what's being written in that story. And so just like their parents had to deal with, they, they created their story and they're still building it. Uh, the students have a story in which, you know, they're going through this and then how are they going to respond and, and become better because of it? And then finally, I would just say celebrating success. Um, success is so important and you have to create opportunities for success. Um, I know a lot of times in, in the past, uh, you know, we have standards. Uh, I respect those standards. But uh, we also have to realize that in the social emotional, as well as creating that story, we, ha we have to allow children to have opportunities to have success and to celebrate that success to be a part of their story. Um, we're, we're so beat down in media with all the negativity. Uh, we're, you know, I, I heard the terrible news of uh, some of my colleagues here of, of death, as well as illness. And we've, we've had the same thing happen, you know, down here. But we still have to find that, that light at the end of the tunnel as to, you know, what we're going through and, and what we're going to come out to see on the other side. And um, it, it's really an honorable time to be an educator, to, uh, to be here to lead kids and to lead staff members through this. And it's also a trying time. And um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's on this webinar, as well as to you, David, for, uh, you know, emceeing this event because uh, – it's really a, uh, a family affair as an educator. It's a, it's a team affair and ups and downs, and we really got to be there for each other. So I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of this and, uh, and allowing for South Fort Myers to have the uh, success that we've had uh, not only last year, but what we're having right now. So thank you all. Well, thank you as well. So th with that, I'm going to wrap us up for today. Um, ended on a great note there. So that was fantastic. We are all in this together, this work of, of educating and supporting our students and families. Um, we're in the business of, of developing our students uh, academically, socially, emotionally. We know that it's the whole child picture that matters the most. And I'm so glad that each of you is able to speak to that today, um, just naturally by the way you you know lead your work and, and lead your schools and, and really are appreciative of the chance to hear your your uh, points of view and some of your information and stories. But 
a great reminder to go out on remembering to celebrate. We have to look for the successes, find them and elevate them for everybody in our building or everybody online as it may be. So I wanna thank our panelists. Um, you represent a really great uh, way to think about this work for our students, our families and our schools across the country. Um, we're in multiple time zones today, so we thank you so much for that. Um, the event that we just had, we'll have it recorded so we can share it with you who are online and you can share it with others. Give us a few days to get that up online, but there'll be multiple ways that we'll share this with you so you can make sure others hear some of the great information that was able to be shared today. If anything, we all know that we're not alone when we hear from these great leaders who have been thinking about this work. Uh, they were very real today, so we thank them for being very real today. And really good luck to um, everybody as we continue to work our way uh, through January, which we know sometimes is the longest month of the year and a regular year. Uh, wishing everybody the very best from the Bar Center and hope that you have a great rest of your school year.